The idea of a creative deity is gradually being abandoned, and nearly all truly scientific minds admit that matter must have existed from eternity. It is indestructible, and the indestructible cannot be created. It is the crowning glory of our century to have demonstrated the indestructibility and the eternal persistence of force. Neither matter nor force can be increased nor diminished. Force cannot exist apart from matter. Matter exists only in connection with force, and consequently a force apart from matter and superior to nature is a demonstrated impossibility. Force, then, must have also existed from eternity, and could not have been created. Matter in its countless forms, from dead earth to the eyes of those we love, and force in all its manifestations, from simple motions to the grandest thought, deny creation, and defy control. Thought is a form of force, we walk with the same force with which we think. Man is an organism that changes several forms of force into thought force. Man is a machine into which we put what we call food and produce what we call thought. Think of that wonderful chemistry by which bread was changed into the divine tragedy of Hamlet. A god must not only be material, but he must be an organism capable of changing other forms of force into thought force. This is what we call eating. Therefore, if the god thinks he must eat, that is to say, he must of necessity have some means of supplying the force with which to think, it is impossible to conceive of a being who can eternally impart force to matter and yet have no means of supplying the force thus imparted. If neither matter nor force were created, what evidence have we then of the existence of a power superior to nature? The theologian will probably reply, We have law and order, cause and effect, and beside all this, matter could not have put itself in motion. Suppose, for the sake of an argument, that there is no being superior to nature, and that matter and force have existed from eternity. Now suppose that two atoms should come together. Would there be an effect? Yes. Suppose they came in exactly opposite directions, with equal force. They would be stopped, to say the least. This would be an effect. If this is so, then you have matter, force, and effect without a being superior to nature. Now suppose that two other atoms, just like the first two, should come together under precisely the same circumstances, would not the effect be exactly the same? Yes, like causes producing like effects is what we mean by law and order. Then we have matter, force, effect, law and order without a being superior to nature. Now we know that every effect must also be a cause, and that every cause must be an effect. The atoms coming together did produce an effect, and as every effect must also be a cause, the effect produced by the collision of the atoms must, as to something else, have been a cause. Then we have matter, force, law, order, cause, and effect without a being superior to nature. Nothing is left for the supernatural but empty space. His throne is a void, and his boasted realm is without matter, without force, without law, without cause, and without effect. But what put all this matter in motion? If matter and force have existed from eternity, then matter must have always been in motion. There can be no force without motion. Force is forever active, and there is, and there can be, no cessation. If, therefore, matter and force have existed from eternity, so has motion. In the whole universe there is not even one atom in a state of rest. A deity outside of nature exists in nothing, and is nothing. Nature embraces with infinite arms all matter and all force. That which is beyond her grasp is destitute of both, and can hardly be worth the worship and adoration even of a man. 
There is but one way to demonstrate the existence of a power independent of and superior to nature, and that is by breaking, if only for one moment, the continuity of cause and effect. Pluck from the endless chain of existence one little link, stop for one instant the grand procession, and you have shown beyond all contradiction that nature has a master. Change the fact just for one second that matter attracts matter and a god appears. The rudest savage has always known this fact and for that reason always demanded the evidence of miracle. The founder of a religion must be able to turn water into wine, cure with a word the blind and lame, and raise with a simple touch the dead to life. It was necessary for him to demonstrate to the satisfaction of his barbarian disciple that he was superior to nature. In times of ignorance this was easy to do. The credulity of the savage was almost boundless. To him the marvelous was the beautiful, the mysterious was the sublime. Consequently, every religion has for its foundation a miracle, that is to say, a violation of nature. That is to say, a falsehood. No one in the world's whole history ever attempted to substantiate a truth by a miracle. Truth scorns the assistance of miracle. Nothing but falsehood ever attested itself by signs and wonders. No miracle ever was performed, and no sane man ever thought he had performed one. And until one is performed... There can be no evidence of the existence of any power superior to and independent of nature. The church wishes us to believe. Let the church or one of its intellectual saints perform a miracle, and we will believe. We are told that nature has a superior. Let this superior for one single instant control nature, and we will admit the truth of your assertion. We have heard talk enough. We have listened to all the drowsy, idealist, vapid sermons that we wish to hear. We have read your Bible and the works of your best minds. We have heard your prayers, your solemn groans, and your reverential amens. All these amount to less than nothing. We beg at the doors of your churches for just one little fact. We pass our hats along your pews and under your pulpits and implore you for just one fact. We know all about your moldy wonders and your stale miracles. We want this year's fact. We ask only one. Give us one fact of charity. Your miracles are too ancient. The witnesses have been dead for nearly two thousand years. Their reputations for truth and veracity in the neighborhood where they resided is wholly unknown to us. Give us a new miracle and substantiate it by witnesses who still have the cheerful habit of living in this world. Do not send us to Jericho to hear the winding horns, nor put us in the fire with Shadrach, Moshech, and Abednego. Do not compel us to navigate the sea with Captain Jonah, nor dine with Mr. Ezekiel. There is no sort of use in sending us fox-hunting with Samson. We have positively lost interest in that little speech so eloquently delivered by Balaam's inspired donkey. It is worse than useless to show us fishes with money in their mouths and call our attention to vast multitudes stuffing themselves with five crackers and two sardines. We demand a new miracle, and we demand it now. Let the church furnish at least one, or forever after hold her peace.